Hi, this is Rod Stone, guitarist from 1960s groups The Librettos and, uh, more importantly, The Groove, and you're listening to Retrospectives with John Broughton on Casey Radio 97.7 FM. Just take it as we go. Uh, you started off on piano, I believe, before you started on guitar. When did the focus shift towards guitar for you? Wow, well, you, you've been researching some ancient history there, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I started to learn piano when I was at primary school, and uh, I had several different teachers. I, I gave up and then wanted to go back to it again, and so I went back and, you know, blah, blah. Uh, about the time I discovered rock, mate, Mm. That was when it was, um, which would have been late fifties, um, you know. And I discovered rock music, and I I knew, and Elvis Presley in particular. Now I knew he had a guitar because I seen photos of him with it hanging around his neck. <laughs> but but uh, I, I didn't even know there were electric guitars. But I thought, well, I want to play this rock music, so I have to get a guitar. Right. And uh, that's where I started. I was just like. Probably started about 12, I would think. So it was basically classical piano you were playing beforehand, was it? Uh, well, my last teacher was a modern one. I went to modern piano to learn, you know, more modern type of music. And I actually, which was very useful, actually, because I learned a whole lot about chords, you know. So, um, yeah, I gave up the classical and went to a modern teacher for my last one. And then, then I just started teaching myself and learning from friends on the guitar, you know. Now I've got a guitar for my 13th birthday. Fantastic. Tell us how the, the librettos came together initially. How did that happen? Okay, right. Um, well, it was it was all the guys at the same high school and in the same neighbourhood uh, who were interested in the thing. You know, we the first librettos band was all guys from a school called Rongatai College, which is still there in Wellington. Um... You know, we're all mates from school, and and we sort of played together. And I used to go down to one of the, my mates' houses. His bigger brother was in a band, you know, and we used to go down there and learn, try to learn the songs. And, and it all came together bit by bit. And there we were. We were a band of made made from the kids from school, you know. Mm. And uh, then it, uh, we thought of the, <laughs> my friend, the drummer, and I. We decided we had to have a name, so we opened the Oxford Dictionary and stuck a pin in it. <laughs> and it hit the, word, hit the word libretto, um, and we thought, oh, that's, I thought that's a real good omen because that's a musical word, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it means the words, you know. But uh, so we thought that's it. We called ourselves that. Uh, we probably should have been called libretti if we wanted to be correct with the plural, shouldn't we? <laughs> libretti rather than librettos. Yeah. Um, and uh, and 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 then as we, the membership changed occasionally, if you um, dropped in and out, you know. And then the band started, we started to do dance, work with dances, and it started to become successful, you know? And uh, uh, about that time, you know, I, 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 people were starting to leave school, and some going to university, and some going to work, you know? And um, it got to, the band was becoming so busy and, and successful in, in New Zealand that it was, you either had to either give up your day job or the band, one of the two, it got to that. Yeah. And... Uh, I, and so, so a few people who would, <laughs> a couple of the guys who were in the band dropped out because of their studies at university. These are both successful university professors overseas now. These people. Wow. But never mind. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one at Oxford in England, and one in uh, University of California. But that's not a story. Um, but the, so they went took that option, and we replaced them with professional people, and eventually ended up with a full-time professional band. Uh, these these weren't guys from the school. The one, the new ones that came. Yeah. So we we just found other other people we we came in contact with. You know. We get the impression here that it must have been a pretty healthy music scene over there in New Zealand in, in those early days. So many uh, fantastic artists came out of there and, and came over here indeed to try their luck. What, what, was it a particularly thriving scene? Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah, um, there were lots of uh, lots of you know, things going on and places to play and we had regular work and we, in, in the last year I was there, we had we had a, a weekly appearance on a, on a national television show. We were sort of like the resident group on it. And um, 
Um, yeah, and, and, and of course, the thing is, when you become, I suppose it's still the same, I haven't, I haven't lived there since 1965, you know. <laughs> um, the thing is, when, when you get to a certain level, you think, well, what, what's the next step is go to the nearest big city. I mean, if, if, you, if I was in a band, say, in, in, a, in a town like, I don't know, Wangaratta or something, um, if I was starting to become successful, I'd want to move to Sydney or Melbourne, wouldn't I? Of course you would, yeah. To, to pursue a, a, the, the, the career in a bigger city. Well, when you're living in Wellington, where's the nearest big city? Oh, just across the Tasman. Yeah. And, and in those days, no passport, no visa, nothing. You just popped over. So it was pretty much a case that you'd virtually done all you could possibly do over there. Yeah, so we wanted to try and expand in, into a, a bigger market, yeah. Mm. So, sim similarly, as people here in Australia suddenly decide they're going to go to Los Angeles or London or something, you know? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Or, oh, we tried that later as well. But <laughs> <laughs> The librettos didn't achieve the same kind of success in Australia that you, that you Not had. Not at all. No. No, 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 none of our records did any good. The last one we made... Got played a lot on 3UZ in Melbourne, um, because they, they, the DJs there sort of liked it, you know. And mm. Stan Rofe sort of was nice to us, and and another guy, and that records, but they never sold, you know. We had a small cult following, you know what I mean? Like people who thought we were a nice group and would come to our gigs, and mercifully Gary Spry, who I don't really know Gary Spry. Yep, yep. He was a promoter and manager, and he ran one of the first. Uh, music sort of venues in, in Melbourne called Pinocchio's, which was up in Durak. Um, and he liked our band and gave us regular work, or we would have starved, I think. <laughs> <laughs> in, in hindsight, do you have a theory on, on why you didn't quite take off in Australia? Oh, no, not really. Maybe we didn't have the right image, you know. Um, maybe the songs we did just weren't right. Can't say. Mm. Um... With all the bands I've been in, we've always been more interested in the music than the, the showbiz presentation side of things, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, Whereas some, you know, not that she's a group, someone like Lady Gaga is completely the opposite. <laughs> it's all the theatrics and the music secondary, isn't it? Really? Yeah, that's right, it's all the visuals. Yeah, so, but we, we, although you obviously you still pay some attention to the presentation, um, the music was what we were always, same in the groove later, we were always, the music was first and the the presentation was something we just went, you know, on top of it, you know. Um, and maybe we didn't have the right songs and maybe other people had the better presentation. Um, who knows? Mm. <laughs> anyway, uh, we ended up being a trio after a while because one of the guys left and went back to New Zealand to get married. And um, we just we never couldn't find a suitable replacement who was willing to join us. And we went on as a trio. And then when Normie Rowe was going to go to England, uh, two of his band who were, were married in the playlist band didn't want to make the trip to England. So he offered it to myself and Brian Peacock, the bass player in the Brothers. And we sort of said, oh, OK then. <laughs> and um, so when two guys leave a trio, there isn't much left, is there? <laughs> That's about it, yeah. <laughs> it's about the end of it. And, yeah. <laughs> Do you have any standout memories of that uh, that period you spent with the Playboys? With the Playboys? Yeah. Oh, well, it was, we did six months in Australia just sort of, you know, learning the ropes before, with, with Normie's material and that, you know, before we um, went to England. Uh, and all of a sudden I was getting a regular income and could afford to pay for things. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to pay off the higher purchase on my guitar because, um, you know, we were paid a, a set wage. I can't remember what it was now, probably... 40 pounds a week or something and uh, so that was helpful um, obviously when you're touring around with somebody who was what the biggest the biggest pop name in Australia at that time you know so there were, there were crowds and enthusiastic fans everywhere yeah which was a bit different wasn't it <laughs> sort of change <laughs> um, yeah and then of course going to England which was the experience of going to England I mean like as a, as a, just as a tourist but I'm afraid uh we didn't do any good there at all. I guess going to England, you got to witness firsthand the, the struggles of an Australian act trying to break through overseas. I guess you probably could have seen the parallels of that with what you'd just gone through with the librettos in Australia. Well, yeah, yeah. We uh, we wanted to, uh, you know, we uh, normally had a recording deal with um, uh, who was it? <laughs> Can't remember. Um, oh, it'll come to me uh, about midnight tonight. I think of that. <laughs> uh, 
but the recording company, you know, and we were, they didn't like the songs that, see, Brian Peacock and I were writing songs, and they didn't like the songs we were writing. They said, no, 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 boys, no, no, that's no good. And so we, had a, we said, well, we've got a couple of other Australian written songs that we thought maybe we'd like to, you'd like that we could do some of them, you know, because we'd like to do an Australian song. And um, we suggested one of the loved ones tunes. Yeah. I can't remember which one it was now. And we also suggested by the another one by the still unknown overseas group called the Bee Gees. We said, "What about Spicks and Specks? That's a good song." And they go, "No, no, I don't want that. <laughs> Hopeless." So go out, go around the clubs and listen to what music's being played here. So I thought it's funny that they turned down the song that was written by the Bee Gees, but never mind. Oh dear. They would, they would, they wouldn't have about six months later. No. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the groove. All the guys in that band had a, a solid music background already before that group yeah. got together. So you were touted as something of, of, a, of a super group. Did you feel a bit well, of hype? Did you feel like you had a bit of hype to live up to there? Well, I don't know whether we had to live up to it or not, but that well, that hype was certainly put out. And we were married by married managed by Gary Spry, as who I mentioned before, who in Melbourne in that time had had a lot of pull. You know, mm. um, you know, he had he had. He could pull strings at all the major venues and so and and all that. So with with him as manager, uh, us all being experienced guys, we got a recording contract immediately with EMI, and we just started playing at the at the top venues around town straight away. We didn't have to work our way up to anything. Just started doing it, you know. Yeah. You, you so had that's, a, yeah. You had an obvious leaning with that band towards uh, soul and rhythm and blues type oh, material. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, it was de definitely we were all keen on on doing the soul based thing. Well, um, Peter Williams, our singer, who's still still surviving and alive in Christchurch, <laughs> uh -huh. been, been, been in touch with him in the last week. Yes, he's he's okay. okay. Oh, that's good. Okay, so, um, I mean he he had played for years with Max Merritt, as you probably possibly know. Yeah, um, and he wanted to, he wanted to become a front man singing with a bit more pop idea about it. And, but the whole brainchild of the whole band was really the, the, the keyboard player, the late Tweed Harris, uh, and with Gary Spry. He wanted Gary to manage the band, and he wanted to put together a band to play the soul music with the nice R&B feel, but have a commercial edge to it. In fact, I think his actual words at one stage were, we want to put a band like Max Merritt, only a commercial version. Okay. That's, that's what he had in mind, you know? Um, so I, I, I had worked with Tweed before, and I knew Peter well, uh, the other two guys were a little younger than us, and I didn't know them at all, but uh, we got to know them. <laughs> what about uh, selecting material to cover for that band? Did you have a particular criteria in mind? No, just stuff that we thought was cool, I think. Um, now, I know um, our first couple of records, which were, which, uh, uh, were stuff we were playing on stage, you know? Yeah. So then, then we were talking with our record producer, which is Dave Mackay, uh, it's a matter of saying, you know, well, let, you know, what should we record? Record that, you know. Um, and our first one, Simon says, did reasonably. It's people who don't know must not get confused. It's nothing to do with the 1910 Fruit Come Company song. No. It's a completely different song written by the Isley Brothers. And our version came out, our record came out a year before the 1910 Fruit Come Company. But I, I have read it in writing up somewhere that, that we actually covered that song but it, we didn't <laughs> <laughs> and um the soothe me song we did which was the best most successful thing we ever did we did that because we're looking for a follow-up record and that was by far and away the, our most popular number when we would do a show you know that would always go over big so people said well perhaps we'll record that that's a single mm. yeah and because i was really while i was in england with normie just before i came back uh, I went with Normie himself to see a show called the, uh, the Stacks Vault Review. You've heard of that? Yeah. That was with Otis Redding topping the bill. Uh, the band was Booker T and the MGs and the Marquis with this was for the sax section. And um, Sam and Dave were on it. Um, uh, Eddie Floyd. You know, it was all the black soul artists from yeah. America, right? Well, that too changed, changed my life musically. Well, having seen that, I was—I I didn't feel about music the same ever again, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, that, that was the Sam and Dave version of Soothe Me, not the original version, but the Sam and Dave version that I said to the guys when we got the 
band together back in Australia. Oh, we've got to play this. This is really good. Mm. And we did. <laughs> That's how That's it right. went. That's right. They did, a, they did a mighty version of that song. Sam and Dave? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the first time I'd ever heard it. I didn't even know it was a Sam Cooke song at that stage. I saw them do it live in London, mate. It was fantastic. Mm. Now, you won the uh, prestigious Hoadley's Battle of the Sounds, which I guess for many bands was uh, their only ticket out of Australia to, to try their luck overseas. How competitive was, was that amongst the bands? Oh, to, to try and get the item was very competitive, yeah. The, concert, comp, the competition was very competitive indeed. But hindsight, I think you're probably better off if you came second. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, if you wanted to have see, because anyone, nobody who won it ever did anything any good overseas. That's right. Um, but if we'd have stayed in Australia, and we would have become a little bit famous for coming second, and we might have been able to consolidate our position, because we were, we were only working in, in Australia for not much more than 18 months, you know. Mm. Very short, you know, we went, Phew, we were doing the right, had records on TV, won the competition, off to England, never heard of again. <laughs> I think we were, you know, we would be better remembered and we would have achieved greater things in Australia had we not gone to Britain. That makes sense. Most bands that went over there came back with their tails between their legs, didn't they? Yeah, well, they did, you know, and uh, I mean, had we stayed here, and there's no doubt in my mind at all because we had such good management here. We would have played the Sunbury Festival. We would have appeared on Countdown. We would have done all those things, you know, mm -hmm. to to and have probably had, had more records that are more and uh, working more towards original songs of our own as well. Because we, we recorded a whole album of original material in England, which has never been released. Oh wow! Do you know what ever happened to that? Well, I know where I know. I, I've got a recording of it. Oh, you've got it. <laughs> I've got it, but it's, it was never released. Oh, what a shame! This was. This was after we changed our name to Eureka Stockade. Oh, Stockade, yeah. To give ourselves an Aussie name, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, we wrote a, you know, we, our, we were changed, getting a little bit away from the soul style then. We were getting a bit more sort of, I would say, country rock, you know. We were very much influenced by the group of the band, you know. The, yeah, yeah. The band who, who had that, you know, had a few records out, didn't they? And they used to back Bob Dylan originally. That's correct. But that, yeah. that sort of, we were, they were, we were very much influenced by them and getting to slightly away from the soul thing. And anyway, but uh, some of the stuff on the album still sounds reasonable, I think, yeah. But it, <laughs> it never got released. It was independently financed and produced by Mike Vaughan, who was the Easy Beats former manager. Mm -hmm. And he was, then he decided he was going to flog it to a record company, right? <laughs> Couldn't get any takers. <laughs> <laughs> and then the band all fell apart and Jeff, our drummer, went and joined the Bee Gees and took off around the world. So with the groove in, in England, were you pretty much on a hiding to nothing over there? Was there any remote chance at all of any kind of breakthrough? Did you get a lot of live no. work? No, we got some live work. No, there was, I mean, I, we, didn't, we didn't have what we had here going for us was, you know, really good management plugging for us, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, Gary came over with us, but he didn't have the contact or the pull over there like he did here, you know. And uh, if we'd have had somebody working for us, you know, in the management agency area, we might have got a lot, got a bit better, you know. But uh, I'm not trying to blame anybody anymore. No. So but, no, we, we never even came close to making it in England. The, yeah. the transformation into Eureka Stockade, did you hold high hopes for that? Um... I wasn't, no, not specifically. I just had some hope. We, otherwise, we wouldn't have done it, I suppose, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike Vaughan, you know, who had, had been the Easy Bits manager right up until that time, he, um, he he decided he liked what we were doing and he was going to try and promote us, and he, he put up the money to make this album. And we also, we did one single um, as Eureka Stockade, which was released in England, and as I found out many, many years later in uh, <laughs> in other countries in Europe as well. Um, of course, I don't think it sold any anywhere ever. Probably hasn't sold any copies. No, I actually, I did find it on. But the I, I, I got, a, I've got, you know, some of our records we released over there. I never knew this. I've got a, 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 an Italian release of ours. I've got a German release, a Belgian release with a picture cover. <laughs> I, I found these on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> And Actually, yeah. I did find a, an MP3 of that uh, single on the internet the other day. I had to listen to it. Which uh, single was that? The the one single that uh, Eureka Stock A put out. 
Oh yeah, was, was that on? Was that, was that? Oh, it was, I'll have to shuck it down for you again. It was on some oh. uh, some European website of some sort of, of rarities. Was it? Oh, I, I think some there's a few MP3s on my website for people to have a listen to if they want to. I don't know. I don't know. I've got a couple of Eurekas, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> those uh, you can get the entire librettos re- re- reissue CD downloaded illegally from Russia if you want. From Russia. Goodness yeah. Me. I reported it to the. Um, to, you know the copyright people here and they said yes we know it's not only your album there's lots of them and there's not much we can do about it because it's in Russia so there you go mm. they, they're giving it away you know like you want the album here it is here have it, it is. You know? go for it Goodness go for me. it you know but, uh, well, I, I suppose at least I'm not charging for it it makes me no. it annoys me if people are charging for pirated music it's yeah. like shit because we've always shared it it's just it's uh, you know 40 years ago we'd use a reel to reel tape recorder to tape our friends records you know yeah, that's right. We did too. <laughs> and uh, but it just now with the net and that, it's so widespread and vast, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Have, have you considered approaching Aztec Music with that Eureka Stockade uh, album you've got there? Uh, no, I don't even know who Aztec Music are. You don't? No. Uh, I'll send you some information there because I reckon they could, they could be interested. Well, possibly. Um, Gareth Bryce said to me he. he Somebody he knew want, want, wanted to might, might want to release it, but uh, it was, oh, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a grey area who actually owns the rights to half of it. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, Aztec music, Aztec music is uh, Gil Matthews's label. Uh huh. Well, I don't know him personally, but I know who you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, see, because the rights, who owns the rights to it? At the time we wrote those songs, we had all signed a uh, contract with Shaftesbury Music to put out all the songs we wrote to them. I'm, I don't know whether they still, would still have the rights to them because it was never released, you know, it was never done, never published. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually, like, usually there's a sunset clause on those agreements that if they haven't, re- you know, published the work within a year, you can ask for it back, you know. Um, and then who owns the rights to the recordings? Because does, does Mike Vaughan own it? Because he paid for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a grey area, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So after that chapter of your career was over, did it take long for you to des- decide what you wanted to do next? Uh, well, when the band broke up, fortunately, through a few contacts we'd established, through um, the guy who, you know, the Cliff, Cliff Richards manager, was uh, you know, uh, an expat Australian. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, it wasn't, no. <laughs> it's another one of those names that's just escaping for a minute. I know it so well. I met the man. Um, and they needed a guitarist to do a... So I started doing freelance guitar work in England, you know, mm-hmm. a freelance um, jobbing musician. Yep. Because um, fortunately I was able to read a bit, you know, so I could, you know, get in, sit in and do the charts, play the charts, you know. And um, <coughs> they needed a guitarist. To, they wanted to add an extra guitarist to the band at, at London's Talk of the Town nightclub, which was a big deal nightclub in those days. I don't know if you think it's even there anymore. And Cliff Richard was doing a month season there. This was in 1970. And I went to an audition for the gig and got accepted. And we did, uh, you know, six nights a week for a month. Good money. Playing at that, you know, and through that... Uh, through that organisation, I got other gigs, you know, and then you sort of, you get a few. Uh, and I used to get quite a lot of gigs, you know, backing cabaret artists around around, around England. Quite often, they would go to work in some of the clubs up in the north and that, mm. uh, but they would take a rhythm section with them from London, which would which we'd rehearse before we go, and then right, we're off, and then they'd just add, add the frontline guys when they got to where they were going. And I worked with all sorts of big-name people, not necessarily big-name musical people, but still big-name people. One of my favourite moments I remember is doing a week's season with Morecambe and Wise, if you know who they were. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought that was wonderful. Very little music to be played. <laughs> but it just, just I thought, well, what? I'm, play- I'm playing with these incredibly famous funny men. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I did lots of people. I did work with Dick Emery. You know, these, these are not musical people, but they were big stars, you know what I mean? Yeah. And you get quite well paid for it. It's, the trouble was... You might not do anything at all for a month then until the next gig came up, you know? Yeah. So the money got spread a bit thin, and in the end I decided to pull up the stumps and come home. And But 
but that experience I got there enabled me to do that sort of work when I got back here. So when you got back here, you got got involved in session work. But you weren't looking to get back into a, a band situation again. Well, I, I because it, when I got back in Australia, I had uh, my clothes on my back, uh, my guitar, a wife, and two small children. So I had to get some regular money from somewhere. Yeah, didn't I? yeah. So I took a job playing in a in a nightclub. You know that well, it's, it's uh, the first time it's called Los Gitanos up in Chapel Street, Paran. It's, I think it's still there, but it's called something else completely. I can't know what it's called, but it's in Chapel Street, Paran anyway. Yeah, yeah. But the building's still there, and it's still a club, I think. But, but yeah, you know, all of a sudden, I'm on a full-time wage, and that was cool, because I've been struggling in England for, with the money, and then all of a sudden, hey, here I am. I got, I got regular income, and it was cool. But I started doing session work as well, and... Uh, a lot of freelance, you know, stuff in the daytime and that. So what would have been with some of the standout sessions you did in that time? Uh, mostly it was, I didn't do very many um, pop record sessions. It was mostly for advertising. Uh-huh. So you, they, in those days, they don't do it much anymore. They used to use real musicians on the edge, you know, yes. <laughs> to play the music tracks instead of all the computerized stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, and I did a few tours here. We toured with... Uh, I did a tour with Gene Pitney and, uh, and, and you know, and it just the odd thing, and I worked around the clubs, as I say, but the session work was cool, and I uh, did a couple of theatre shows, you know, uh, you know, and the, I did the whole season of the best little whorehouse in Texas, if you ever heard of that one. Yep. Yep. Well, I was going to say in a pit orchestra, but in that show, it wasn't a pit, you were actually on stage wearing cowboy outfit. <laughs> Um, you know, and a few a few things like that. Oh, I did a did a week with the two Ronnie shows. You know, that sort of you know backing artists, that same sort of stuff again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just but session work. Lots. I used to do lots and lots of recording session work, two or three a week. But that was mostly for jingles, you know. Yeah. I did a few album tracks. I did played. I played on Kerry Bedell's our first album. Um, I even did a single with Mommy Row, but I can't remember which one. <laughs> When I came in his later years. Yeah. So basically you're a guitar player for hire. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was. That's why I ended up being, and, and now I'm not even that. <laughs> now I'm a guitar teacher for hire. <laughs> no, I decided to pack in the gigs. It's just got a bit too much for me. Jumping forward a few years, tell us about Stone Orchard. Oh, that. You must have researched me a little bit here. I've looked around. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what happened there was... Um, I, I was playing in a, in a, I'd got to play in a, re, in a, uh, a reception type band, right? Playing covers, playing at weddings, balls, 21st birthdays, you know, the sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I decided that as my, I was getting on an age and I'd better have a last fling if I'm going to, because otherwise I'll be too old. Right? <laughs> so I thought I'd try and get my own band together. I left that. I was going to try and get my own band together and get some, uh, you know, play my own music, stuff I was writing and stuff that I liked and arrangements, you know. And, uh, but my, what I didn't have <laughs> was any management or promotional or agency skills. And I didn't, I, I uh, should have hired, you know, I should have gone and got myself an agent and a manager. But the band I was trying to get together, I had a couple of rehearsals and I tried a few guys, to, I couldn't get anybody to be committed. Except this young guy, Matt Orchard, who had been my daughter's boyfriend. Uh-huh. And he's still working as a professional performer, solo, down down on the, down Apollo Bay Way, you know, he's on the coast down there, doing gigs down there. But um, he's, they've, they're both um, they're not, they're not friends anymore, haven't been for years. They weren't even then, you know. But that's how I knew him. And he suggested to me, oh, well, change that. Why don't we just put a Joe together and do a couple of things? So we did. But we never, I thought he, I thought he had all the contacts to get all the cool jobs because he'd played in some band and done all the, the, the cool pubs around the place, you know, here in Melbourne. Yeah. But it, he didn't. <laughs> and I was hopeless. I mean, that, I was, a, as a manager agent, I'm hopeless. Totally hopeless, all right? Mm. Um, I should have gone and got somebody to look, you know, offer them a percentage to 
market us, you know, but I didn't. And we got a few gigs around the place and played at the Frankston Guitar Festival, and uh, which is defunct now, of course, but um, we never really made, you know, we never really got very far. And then uh, Maddie decided to move to Apollo Bay, and that was the end of that. That was it, and that was your final fling. Well, you know, like we did a couple of gigs after that. If it was worthwhile for me to go down there or him to come up here. Yeah. But, you know, even to get together to rehearse, it's a three and a half hour drive from where I lived to his place. <laughs> um, so that didn't work, and, and uh, I'm sure he, I'm, as far as I know, he's happily. Uh, it's a young man about 40, I'd say he'd be about now, about that. And uh, he's, as far as I know, happily doing casual music gigs all along the coast down there, you know? So now, that's what happened. It was, our, it, was, it was my last fling, and I didn't, make, I didn't do it very well. <laughs> and then I went back to just being a guitarist for hire. Yep. And uh, then that, that, that's gradually started to fade away, and... Uh, I decided I'm not looking for gigs anymore. I still play at home every day for my own, keep my hand in and for my own pleasure. And you're teaching and these I days? Teach, yeah. I do a bit of teaching privately and I, I work in a, in a school as well, yeah. That's what I do. So teaching guitar after all these years, do you, going through the process of teaching, do you sometimes find you're teaching yourself new things? Um, perhaps not so much now, because I've been teaching for 30 years, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you learn by being a teacher. When someone asks you a question, not only don't you know the answer to it, but you've never even thought of the question. Uh-huh. And you think, oh, I'm going to have to research that and find out for, for him, aren't I? And yeah, you do learn things like that. And you you learn that some kids have a problem that you never ever knew that, that, that could be a problem. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You think, oh, I've got to help this, this kid, but he's got a problem there. I never knew such a problem could ever have arisen. So the next time you're teaching someone, you're looking out for it before it happens. You know? yeah. So you become a better teacher because of that. Yeah. Terrific. Sure. I mean, it's like any job, mate. Experience counts for an awful lot, doesn't it? It sure does. <laughs> it sure does. Hey, before I let you go, right, any regrets? Anything, if you could jump in a time machine and go back and change, what would you do? What would I change? I have to, I'd like to change my fate and become an international superstar, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how I could have done that. Um, uh, maybe, get the start. maybe come second <laughs> in the Battle of the Sounds, perhaps. <laughs> uh, in the Stone Orchard thing, if I think if I'd have applied, tried to, you know, found someone to help me with the uh, the management agency promotion side of it, which we had nothing to do, you know. Um, that might have helped that. Uh, what else? I, cool. I don't know. No, I think, you know, we, we gave it our best shot. Yeah. And we did, obviously we made some mistakes all along, the, I mean, all the bands, all along the way. We always gave it our best shot. There's no doubt about that. Um, whether we always did the best things that we should have done, well, you know, if we were, that's what we did and uh, that's what happened, you know. Rod, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure catching up with you. Thanks for your contribution to some uh, memorable music in this country and uh, you can be rest assured your uh, contribution will never be forgotten. <laughs> well, I'm surprised you even knew about it. Uh, you see, I think you're a bit younger than me, aren't you? I am, I am, but I'm uh, a fan of that music. Oh, that's great. I'm that's glad to hear that somebody still listens to it, yeah. <laughs> okay, mate. Okay, it's been a treat. Thanks a lot. And I'll, I'll, thanks, I'll uh, let you know when this is going to air too. Oh, great. Thanks. Good on you. Good on. Thanks, John. Cheers, Rod. Bye. Bye.